Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Myers from the Sacramento County Office of Education, and we are so happy to have you here with us this afternoon at our last webinar in our Shared Practices webinar series, Supporting Student Success with Interim Assessments, brought to you by the California Department of Education. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my friend, Krista Pohl, an education programs assistant with the CDE, who will go ahead and start us off. Krista? Good, a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm Krista Pohl with the CDE Science Assessment Office, and we are thrilled to have you join us today as three local educational agencies share their CAST interim assessment implementation practices and plans. Uh, it's important to know as we kind of get started here um, that the CAST Interim Assessments or IAs were only released last October. So this is the second year that they're available for use. And the educators sharing today created an implementation plan the very first year the CAST Interim Assessments were released. Impressive, ambitious, and we are incredibly lucky to have them here with us to share today. Um, with all of that said, we do understand that the CAST IAs are still relatively new uh, and the shared practices, um, the, the practices that are being shared with you today um, are a few examples of things that you can try to get started or to expand on your current practices also. Now with all that um, and the agenda slide showing, let me go ahead and take us there and go over a few things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, so today we're going to start with just a general overview of the CAST interim assessments. So I'll have the opportunity to kind of lay the groundwork for some general information and refer, refer to some uh, CDE resources for you. Um, and I really will just wanna set the foundation here. The stars of the show are going to be our LEA collaborators and our presenters today. After that, we'll hear from our three local educational agencies. Um, again, the stars of the show, to share their practices um, and successes with the CAST interim assessments. Uh, you'll get to hear from educators about things like implementation plans, standardized and non-standardized manners of administration, um, how to use uh, data in SIRS, and much more. And we're very fortunate to have educators here to share from all levels. So we have elementary school level, middle school level, and high school levels here joining us today, um, and they are from the following districts. We have Delano Union Elementary School District serving communities in Delano, California, uh, San Jacinto Unified School District serving cities in Riverside County, California, and Liberty Union High School District serving communities in Northeastern Contra Costa County, California. And our group today has a wealth of experience which covers a variety of grade levels, different regions of California, um, LEA sizes, some are large, some are small, um, and educator roles, including teachers here, instructional coaches, um, and a district director as well, which is fantastic. And again, our hope is that you get ideas um, about how you might best implement the CAST interim assessments into your own instructional planning. That's where we're really hoping that we go today. And before we jump into a general overview of the CAST interim assessments, I do want to provide a quick acronym guide because we all know and love a good acronym in the world of education. So these are some acron acronyms that may come up today and some that I have already said, um, honestly. So interim assessments or IAs, you'll hear this interchangeably a lot throughout the webinar today. Um, so if you hear IAs, it just means interim assessments. SIRS is the California Educator Reporting System. A few of us will be re uh, referring to SIRS. THSS is the Teacher Hand Scoring System. And then you're going to hear about manners of administration today, standardized and non-standardized manners of administration. Um, the standardized manners of administration are more like a benchmark style standalone assessment or test. And non-standardized manner of administration is more of a formative, a progress monitoring type of tool that can be embedded into instruction. And for today's webinar, uh, you're going to be hearing CAST several times, the California Science Test, CAST with a T, not CASP with a P throughout the webinar, um, although CAST does fall under the CASP umbrella. Uh, now I challenge you to say that five times fast. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and get started with a quick overview of the CAST interim assessment. So we begin with the fundamental understanding of what they are and how they can be used in the classroom. We're gonna jump into the purpose and intention behind the IAs. So they're free, they're flexible, and they're both for and of learning, but what does all of that mean? Uh, let me get into some detail here. Um, so the CAST interim assessments and all interim assessments are available year round and they provide meaningful information to guide instruction and support student learning. Uh, during the 2023-2024 school year, so last school year, we had 23,000 CAST interim assessments um, start. Uh, as of net right now, so in October, October 1st, just in October, uh, we have 12,000 CAST interim assessments that have uh, been administered in the school year so far, which is 
Very exciting to me and my team. Um, so to get a better idea of the why behind those figures, why are 12,000 people starting the CAS interim assessments? Let's, let's talk about this, this diagram and kind of dive in a little deeper. So interim assessments, including the CAS IAs, are free resources provided by the California Department of Education, or CDE, which can both inform and support teaching and learning in multiple ways. Uh, their intended purpose is to evaluate student knowledge and skills during the year, so throughout the school year. They can be used flexibly as both assessments for learning and of learning. Um, and what I mean by this is that interim assessments can be administered as a standard in a standardized manner, um, kind of as a formal individual assessment or in a non-standardized manner, which some of our presenters will talk a lot more about today. A couple more things to note um, specifically about the CAST IAs for one of these is the three dimensionality of the and the accessibility features of the CAST IAs. Uh, so the CAST IAs are examples of three dimensional assessments that can um, help classroom teachers understand how the California NGSS performance expectations or PEs can be fully assessed. And each item has gone through the same rigorous development process as the items on the summative assessment on the end of the year CAST to ensure that they're examples of really high quality um, assessment items. Also for all interim assessments, um, they offer the full range of CASP with the P accessibility resources uh, so that students are able to show what they know and can do using the same resources they're familiar with in everyday classroom instruction and in assessment. Now, before we continue, um, I do want to provide a reminder about the security of interim assessments because they are secure material. Um, under California Education Code 60642.7, uh, it's gonna prohibit the use of interim assessments for any high stakes decision or purpose. So this is like course placement, identification as gifted or talented, or reclassification of English language le learners, just to name a few. Another important note is that interim assessments are copyrighted, uh, so they may not be used on third party platforms or systems. So things like Google Classroom or Canvas, um, they can't be posted on. They're only to be used within the systems provided by the CDE. Now, in terms of administration, just like the Smarter Balance interim assessments, the CAST interim assessments are optional. Uh, they're fixed form assessments, which means if you give the assessment more than once to the same student, they're gonna see the same questions in the same order. Um, but new this school year, which is very exciting, we have nine additional CAST interim assessments. So as of last October, there were nine, now there are 18, so we have double um, for classroom use. So there are two interim assessments per grade level for grades three, four, and five. And then for middle school and high school, there are now six interim assessments available for each, so two for each domain. Uh, next um, is IAs are flexible. Uh, so I said this earlier, but it's really important to emphasize, and you'll see the flexibility throughout today's webinar as all of our presenters share how they're using them. But each individual CAS inter interim assessment is designed to take less than 50 minutes. Um, that's five zero. Um, and they're, they, but they can be administered in any time allotment that makes sense for your classroom and for your students. Uh, also, the interim assessments can be administered at any time during the school year. So they can be started now they can be started, you know, any month, any month you're in school, really, um, whenever they make sense for you in your classroom. And then more flexibility coming at you. Uh, middle school and high school are by grade band and domain specific, so they can be administered to students at any grade level to address their curriculum needs. Same goes for elementary school. Um, so grades three, four, and five can be administered outside of their grade level. So if you have some third grade items that you want to give to a fifth grade student, that's great. Do what works for your students. And finally, the evidence gathered from student responses on the interim assessments can be used to inform instructional practices. <clears throat> so educators may want to consider what information they want to know, so what are you seeking to find before selecting the, admin, uh, the interim assessment um, that you want to give to your students. All right, let's talk structure. So what do they actually look like if you were to administer a CAST interim assessment, if you haven't yet? Um, in elementary, they're organized by grade level performance expectation or PE. So the CAST IAs for grades three, four, and five assess all three science domains. So earth and space sciences, life sciences, and physical sciences. In middle school and high school, the CAST interim assessments are organized by science domains. So there are six middle school and six high school CAST interim assessments, and they each assess one science domain across the grade band. And remember, just like the summative CAST, um, the engineering subdomains, so engineering technology and applications of science or ETS, is baked into these three science domains. Uh, and each of the LEAs sharing today, um, we'll talk a little bit about how they made the organization and the structure work for their sites. 
Now for some detail, like how many items are included on each and what types of items you're going to encounter. Um, each of the cast interim assessments are composed of two segments, the so segment A and segment B. Um, the interim assessment segments follow the summative assessment structure with the discrete items coming first and then the performance task. So segment A is gonna contain the discrete or standalone items. Um, and the discrete items are going to measure a wider range of PEs. And then the um, for grade three through five, there are nine discrete items on the interim assessments. And for high school, there are 10 uh, discrete items for segment A. And then we have segment B, which is going to be one single performance task, which is going to contain four to six items um, with one constructed response, which will require some hand scoring. And a performance task is designed to provide some deep deep measurement of a targeted sample of PEs. So this is gonna measure between two and three. And there is an excellent new resource that I did want to mention and plug here, um, just because it's a really great resource across the board for not just CAS, but all interim assessments. It's called the Interim Assessment Lookup Tool. It's linked in your resource guide, but this link, this uh, tool is going to allow you to kind of take a look at what are you looking, what are you trying to measure and um, what interim assessment is gonna be best fit your needs? How many items are on it? how many hand scores uh, are required. Um, so it's just something that I really wanted to point out and offer you to spend some time there later if you wish. Now I do want to finish up with kind of the general overview here by taking a quick second and mentioning data from the student, um, student responses in SIRS. And this will be the last topic for me before I get to turn it over to our amazing and knowledgeable presenters. Um, but shown here are three possible levels reported for each CAST interim assessment. You'll see below standard, near standard, and above standard. Um, and the CAST interim uh, assessment scores are reported per interim assessment. So for example, if you were to uh, administer all three middle school science domains um, and all three interim assessments, you'll get a score for each assessment, each interim assessment, not a score for all three combined. Um, and there is a link in your resource guide that I again want to point out is what's called Understanding the CAST Summary Reports, which is a web page with additional information on the domain descriptors. So for more information, feel free to explore that. Um, I've taken a few minutes now to lay the foundational pieces about the CAST IAs, and it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our first LEA presenters. But before I introduce them, I do want to remind you to write your questions as they come up using Zoom's Q&A feature. Um, it's right down below in the Zoom bar, usually on the bottom, but each presenter will spend some time after their segment answering your questions. So as they come to you, type them in so we can use all of our time wisely for Q&A. Um, now kicking us off with some plans for implementation and administration um, in a fifth grade classroom in Delano Union School District, we have two excellent educators, Joanna Trigo, who is a science instructional coach for Delano Union Elementary School District, and Vivian Rodriguez, who was the lead fifth grade teacher during the 2023-2024 school year. And in collaboration with Joanna, helped her fifth grade team get started with an implementation plan for the CAST interim assessments. We are very lucky to have them here to share today. Um, so please welcome uh, Joanna and Vivian. Joanna, uh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Krista. Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Trigo, and we wanted to start off by saying how grateful we are for the opportunity to share some of the ways in which these new CAST IAs have impacted our school and our district. So our district in Delano is composed of nine elementary schools and four middle schools. Uh, we serve a student population of 34.2% English learners, 9.9% uh, special education, and 88.3% of students that are identified as social economically disadvantaged. The total number of students that we serve is 4,501 students in TK through eighth grade. Now, although we will be highlighting what was done here at Nueva Vista, I wanted to add that we have other sites in our district that have implemented the CAST IAs with positive results on their CAST scores. I'm excited to share some of the ways in which uh, the CAST IA impacted our school, and I hope you leave inspired and motivated knowing that through collaboration and sharing of ideas, many goals can get accomplished. So my journey into the CAST IA implementation here at Nueva began with a simple announcement to the fifth grade team about the availability of these brand new assessments. Uh, from that point forward, it was Vivian and her team that took the initiative and decided they were going to administer the fifth grade CAST IA in standardized form. Uh, so standardized administration means it was used in a traditional summative assessment format with students 
logging into CASP, similar to how they take the SBAC, um, and with teachers hand scoring constructed response questions through SIRS, which Krista mentioned is the California Educator Reporting System. Later on, Vivian will go into more detail on how the CAST IAs were used in a non-standardized way. For the standardized administration, all Nova Vista fifth grade students took the grade five CAST IA assessment in early February, 2024. One positive thing noticed right away was that students didn't hesitate to type their answers when faced with the constructed response question. Um, the fifth grade team attributed this success to the intentional work they had done earlier in the year to seek out NGSS resources that allowed them to expose students to other NGSS aligned assessments, such as those found in the Wonder of Science website. These assessments aligned with the science framework provided students with ample practice and familiarity with constructed response style questions they could expect to see on the CAST IA. A copy of the website and example assessment can be found in the resource page. So after hand scoring the constructed responses, teachers were able to see a broader picture of student achievement. Once the teachers had their data, our learning coordinator scheduled a meeting where the teachers and I collaborated to go over the results that were found in the California Educator Reporting System, again, also known as SIRS. We, must, we love our acronyms. Uh, focusing on key distractors and frequently missed questions. We learned that students seemed to struggle with questions that fell into some common categories. We looked at the metadata located at the end of the cast IA document to identify the science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts aligned to each question. So using both the metadata and the cast IA results, we were able to pinpoint that students struggled particularly with the science and engineering practices that included both developing and using models and analyzing and interpreting data. In addition, it was evident that students needed some additional support in the cross-cutting concept of cause and effect. Once again, Vivian will say more about how they approach this cross-cutting concept. As mentioned in the previous slide, the distractor analysis identified students uh, missed questions that included interpreting graphs and data tables. So using this information, the instruction that followed was tailored to help students identify significant features, patterns, and relationships between variables presented in the questions, similar to the ones found in the CAST IA. They incorporated IXL skills in science to give students extra practice with analyzing and interpreting data. IXL is an online platform that helps students learn at their own pace and provides feedback to teachers on student progress. Displayed here is an example of a graph that students often encounter on the CAST. In this situation, students are tasked to compare these two bar graphs to find correlations and patterns that will allow them to answer the question. Now, it is my honor to introduce Vivian. She's gonna to continue to share more of what her and her team did in terms of using the CAST IA in a non-standardized way. So thank you, Mrs. Trigo, and hello everyone. I am Vivian Rodriguez, and I hope that you are able to take something that we shared today and implement it into your science instruction right away. And as mentioned, by Mrs. Trigo, Nueva Vista is a true testament of the power of teamwork because it truly takes a village. So I will start um, talking about the non-standardized administration, which simply means that the test is given as a whole class learning opportunity. There was no data collected. It allowed me and my team to look at the CAST IA and use the questions as a teaching tool. We utilize the non-standardized administration to review types of questions and show my students the various tools offered through the CAST, like a strike through, and to talk through the questions with them. Following the CAST IA and data analysis, we identified specific question areas for targeted instruction. To reinforce learning, we reviewed multiple CAST IA questions as a class. We recognized that there was a pattern that needed to be addressed, and that pattern was that most missed past IA questions related to dun, 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 cause and effect. We used thinking maps to scaffold instruction of the cast questions to enhance student mastery of the process. 
It is important to recognize that the CAST IA heavily emphasized science and engineering practice number two, cause and effect. We thought as a team, if we empower our students with the necessary skills and strategies to approach these question types, our students can we can increase our student confidence in tackling these types of questions. We explicitly taught students how to use thinking maps to understand the question prompts. And here you see an example of a thinking map, which is a multi-flow map for cause and effect. Thinking maps were used to scaffold instruction. To bridge the gap between the lab-related questions on the cast and the lack of exposure, we transformed some of the questions into class lab activities to provide students with direct application. For example, one cast IA question was about food coloring dispersing into various cups of water at different temperatures. So what did we do? We made it into a lab. We took that question from the cast and we allowed our students to do it in class. We gave them cups of water, some which were cold, some which were at room temperature, some had warm water, and students were able to add food coloring to both three cups and make observations about the way the food coloring moved through the cups. After the lab, my students had a very science-focused discussion about their observations. Developing and using models was another area um, that we felt needed to be taken into consideration in order for our students to really um, thrive in the cast. And so cast questions often include models that can serve as visual scaffolds, but oftentimes our students move straight to the question on a test. They forget about the directions, they forget about the models, and that is what we found was happening often. And so we knew we needed to address it. So we took models from the cast and began our lessons just with the models. So the model displayed on the screen right now is similar to a model that we looked at as a class. We asked prompting, prompting questions to get students to get to notice and wonder about what information they could draw from the model. It was important to get our students to stop and look at the picture and ask themselves the following questions. What do I notice? Is there anything I can compare in the model? Are there any relationships? What differences do I notice about the sets of flowers? What is happening with the flowers that are in the shade? Can I make a claim about the model? Pictures truly are worth a thousand words. The power of visuals was evident as students engage in such rich conversations about the model without needing to refer to the question. So creating equity is something that we value greatly. And so it was important for us to give our students opportunities to thrive in an equitable science environment. So in order to do this, we enhanced students' model building skills. We implemented explicit teaching of how to create and analyze visual representations like pictures, graphs, and diagrams. We... Um, identified the model's components and how they were related. Students were able to extract meaning independently of their reading level or language proficiency. The visual approach created a more equitable learning environment and it leveled out the playing field for all of our students. Now, Mrs. Trigo will share all of the wonderful science that happens on our campus. Thank you, Vivian. Our school's science success wouldn't be possible without the incredible support of our administration. By making science a core component of school culture, our administrators aim to show students how science is relevant to their everyday lives. Pictures here represent the theme logos for the past three years that inspired both classroom and school-wide culminating science events. The greatest school on earth featured the magic of science. The culminating school-wide event involved a circus with science demonstrations as magic tricks. The next year, Nueva Vista digging deeper took us back in time to the dinosaur ages. Students dug deeper into academic excellence and the culminating event was a dino digging day full of paleontology explorations. 
And last year, the NVLA Launching Learners theme took us out of this world. Our culminating school-wide event was the solar eclipse that occurred in April of this year. Vivian will also share some images that showcase how these themes played out on campus. So here we see a non-standardized approach to science learning. We provide student involvement specifically in school-wide science initiatives so that our students are exposed to real life experiences. The pictures below are examples of direct application of science learning through labs and firsthand experiences. In the first image, you see a student who created a lava lamp using water, oil, and Alka-Seltzer, the lesson in the magic of science was all about density. And we didn't let COVID stop us. No, we didn't. <laughs> the first thing I notice in the second picture is that a student is wearing a hat and it says paleontology department. As a school, we are showing our students the multiple opportunities that can come from being a scientist. The student is looking at fossils during our dino digging day. The solar eclipse that happened on April 8th 2024 was a learning experience for us all. You can almost hear the oohs and the ahs from the picture. This again shows that with the right tools, students can experience science in such a meaningful, memorable way. As we look ahead, the future at Nueva Vista Language Academy continues to look bright. We will continue having data-driven grade level meetings where we will work in conjunction with our learning coordinators and Mrs. Trigo so that we can utilize their support in order to continue using data to drive our science instruction. Vertical alignment in science and progress monitoring. Vertical alignment is crucial. We know that the CAS isn't just a fifth grade assessment, but a K-5 assessment because students in fifth grade have learned the science standards throughout all grade levels. Each grade level is responsible for teaching a set amount of standards. This team roster, which can be found in the resource guide, shows the NGSS standards along with what grade level focuses on that specific standard. This is the vertical articulation piece. Implementation of CAST IAs in third, fourth, and fifth grade. The expectation is that grade levels three through five will administer at least one CAST IA and dive into a data cycle where key distractors are looked at, thinking maps are incorporated, and students really understand how to view models. Teachers can also leverage the questions of the CAST during ELD. The CAST lends itself nicely to ELD because of the academic vocabulary, collaboration, and discussions that can be held. Like I mentioned earlier, it truly takes a village. All grade levels play an important role in the student success of the CAST. The CAST is a cumulative assessment and it starts in kinder. Every grade level has an integral role in doing their part. Thank you, Joanna and Vivian. Fantastic information. And thank you for sharing uh, your successful launch of the CAST IAs last school year. Uh, it's really great to hear that you're expanding use to third through fifth grade this school year. So continuing to expand on your practices, which is fantastic. Um, now we've made it to the first Q&A piece. And as I give Joanna and Vivian some time to look through the questions um, that they would like to answer live, I do wanna take a quick second to remind you about our resource guide. Um, so you can find examples of things like the thinking map that Joanna and Vivian brought up. Um, the team roster is there. There's also some samples of uh, free assessment resources in there as well. But you can take a look at that um, as you wish, um, click on those things. Um, and see what you can find use out of as well. Uh, and just in case you arrived a little bit late, I'll post the um, resource guide and the link to our Google page in the chat one more time in just a second. All right, I do see a few questions that Joanna and Vivian, let's see, want to answer live. I see Joanna's typing here. Vivian, I'm gonna head to you first if you don't mind. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you chose to use the standardized manner of administration first? Yeah, of course. So for us, um, for my team and I, it wasn't a matter of how to administer, but when, right? I knew that the CAST IAs were going to be released and students in previous years struggled with some of the CAST type questions. You know, our fifth, fourth, third, fourth, and fifth graders take the CAST, but 
now they're being exposed to another level level of rigor through the cast. So I knew in my heart that I needed to expose my students to the rigor and expectations of the cast. And as a grade level, we decided to go with the standardized manner of administration because we wanted to look at the data and support our students where the gaps were. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vivian. And I did see, I think, Joanna, you answered the question, but someone asked about what IXL is. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that, just um, in case anyone else has that same question? Yes, yeah, so I went ahead and typed in. Um, so IXL is a program that our district purchased. Um, we, uh, we use it also for math and ELA. It's one of those programs that um, is uh, adaptable as the students are answering questions, they um, you know, move up in levels and it's really a way for the teacher to kind of have to monitor where their learning is at. Um, it allows teachers to also provide uh, or assign skills that they want to focus on. For example, for the fifth grade team, they knew that analyzing and interpreting data was a big one and IXL had a skill set um, on where the students are looking at data tables, so it was like the perfect fit. Awesome. Thank you, Joanna. There's another question here for you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the team roster and the resource guide? Um, does it inform pacing or how does it relate to the CAST interim assessments? So the team roster uh, is actually, I have to thank uh, Tulare County of Education. It is a resource that came from them. It is a visual that shows the performance expectations in kinder through fifth grade. And it's just really nice. Our, our teachers, uh, when they first saw it, it, it was an eye opener for them to see what standards they were uh, responsible for in their grade level. And then more importantly than that, they got to see how some of the standards that they taught, perhaps in third or fourth grade, didn't get addressed in fifth grade. And so for some of those students taking that fifth grade test, their third grade or fourth grade teacher was their fifth grade teacher. And so it really helped um, our lower grades kind of come together, rally around that fifth grade team and um, show that support in that way. It's not called the team roster. I re renamed it that way because I, I always like to look at an look at things in analogies. And I thought this is like a, a game. No one's benched. We're all playing. So all of our grade levels are an integral part, like Vivian said, to the success of our students on that cast. I love that. Thanks, Joanna. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take one and let the two of you take a look at a couple more questions in the Q&A. Someone asked where they can find the correct responses for the CAST interim assessments. Uh, so you will need a TOMS uh, login. So Tom, secure login. And when you log into your account, you'll go under secure materials and you'll click on the CAST resources and you're going to find the test content and answer key. And this is something that one of our presenters coming up next is going to talk a lot about. It's kind of where he jumped off and was able to find a lot of success with the CAST IAs, um, but it's called the Test Content Answer Key. I also do have a link in the resource guide that once it'll make you log into Tom's, once you click on it, it'll take you to Tom's to log in with your secure login, and then it'll take you to the, the where you can find the Test Content Answer Key. So I hope that helps. And then Vivian, I see you typing an answer. Do you want to answer it out loud or would you prefer to just type it in? I can answer it. Awesome, go for it. Um, so the question was, how did we decide when to administer the IA um, because of the MIC, right, when? So for us, we administered in February and we decided that would be the best time because at that point we had already taught all of the fifth grade standards. And, you know, we're coming in assuming that students have learned, you know, the kindergarten, the first grade, second, third, and fourth grade standards within those grade levels. Um, so with us, I think the risk was worth it for us. The gamble was worth it, expo allowing us to expose our students to those questions, even if it was a domain that we didn't necessarily focus on in fifth grade. Um, it was worth the risk for us to do the cast and expose it to expose the students to all of the, the domains. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, there's one more question here about the curriculum that your school has adopted. So if you'd like to share, feel free, Joanna or Vivian, you can take this question. So for the elementary school, um, currently we're using a program called STEM Taught. Um, that's kinder through fifth grade. And for middle school, we have Activate Learning um, at iQuest. It's a um, curriculum that is that it's connected to the um, California standards. And so those are the two for us, elementary and middle school. 
Right. Um, it looks like we've answered just about every question that has come for you both, Joanne and Vivian. So big thank yous to both of you for kicking us off and doing such a wonderful job with the Q&A. Um, for anyone attending, if you have questions that do come up for Vivian and Joanna as we continue, feel free to type them in there. Uh, we'll have a question and answer segment at the end of everyone's at the next presentation as well. So I might start with some questions that uh, Joanne and Vivian didn't get to answer yet if more come up as we continue to move through. Thank you so much, Joanna and Vivian. Such a great job. Um, now that we've heard from educators at the elementary school level, uh, you're now going to get to hear from a teacher who has made the CAS interim assessments work for him and his middle school team. Uh, so jumping into topics like manners of administration and creating a structure that works for you, it's my pleasure to introduce seventh grade teacher and department chair Jacob Mathis, right there on the slide. Um, Jacob, Jacob has been a middle school teacher now for 15 years. He has designed middle school curriculum for both in the classroom and online. Um, and he holds a master's degree in middle school science education. Uh, he's also been his department lead for four years. Before I hand it over to him, I do wanna take another quick second to remind you to write your questions in the Q&A down here in the bottom toolbar as they come up. Um, and then we can get straight to the Q&A segment right after Jacob's presentation. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce seventh grade science teacher and department chair for Monta Vista Middle School at San Jacinto USD, Jacob Mathis. Jacob, take it away. All right, thank you so much. So um, with San Jacinto Unified, San Jacinto is down in Southern California. We are a little bit more of a rural area, so it is a farming community in Southern California. We have a large English language learner population. About 20% of the students at my school site are English language learners. 18% of them, 18% of our population have IEPs and are considered special education students. And about 87% are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So with all that being said, I am one of three middle schools here in San Jacinto. We have two regular middle schools and then a magnet um, middle school. So my school has about 913 students between sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So I'll be talking about how we incorporated those CAST IAs into all three sixth, seventh and eighth grade um, integrated science models. So for me, um, as a middle school teacher, as somebody that's been in the game for, I consider a little bit of time, I always like to work with backwards planning. So the biggest thing for me was when the CAST IAs came out, I was able to really look at the CAST question, even as or the CAST test, even as a seventh grade teacher and say, really looking at how can I prepare my students for this? Not only my students in my classroom, but as the science lead at my site, my sixth grade, my seventh grade, my eighth grade students at my school site. So I really started to look into that and I had to look into really what resources do I have to prepare my students for this rigorous assessment? Because being in education for a long time, even with the, even with the transfer from um, to the NGSS standards, a lot of the times, a lot of teachers feel that they don't have the resources that they need, that they are spending extra time creating these resources when a lot of the times those resources are out there. So um, we can look at the idea of, you know, as I prepare my students, it allows them to not get into that burnout and frustration stage that they often get into. Also, I can find resources that are easily modified to prepare them for the rigors of the state testing because we all know that these state testing questions, whether it is the CASP or the CAS, are written at a really rigorous level with longer passages and images for each question that they are being looked at. So for me, I really went with a method of non-standardized implementation because I found it was the only way that I could really use that data in my classroom. And I really embedded it into the regular instruction for both sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, and worked with my sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade teams on that implementation to be able to increase the rigor 
and to be able to trace out where these cast style questions fit into which grade with the PEs that they are associated with. Now, some of the benefits, I've kind of talked about this just a minute ago. Some of the benefits I have found with the CAST IAs are the rigor of the questions. So the CAST interims hold a lot of value for middle school teachers. With that increased rigor, we begin to challenge the students to that deeper understanding. We take them from a place where they're at and we let them know, look, we need to go deeper, we need to go further. And that's the only way that we are able to push that for them. So using these questions with various lengths and various depth of knowledge, we are able to use this whole class in a setting to be able to help student population, to be able to help every single individual in my class, whether it is a small group setting, whether it's whole class setting, all these different things, but within a non-traditional standard, non-traditional and non-standardized method. So for us, we found it easily accessible for all teachers. Once we were able to break it down, that they were able to get this material and they were able to easily apply it into their classroom settings. Now, um, one of the biggest things for me was the challenge with the challenge of the cast interim assessments. The middle school interim assessments in the testing operating SIT management system or TOMS is only usable for eighth grade due to it being written domain specific. And this was the first roadblock that I ran into. And, you know, personally, when I saw it, I was kind of frustrated and I was like, you know, from talking with um, the individuals at RCOE and other districts, 90% of the districts in Riverside County were in middle school were not, dis were not domain specific. They were an integrated model. And uh, we were always pushed towards that integrated model to show how all science was interconnected and weaved together. So I had to do what was best for my students. So I really you know, had to do that search and I really had to dig deep to be able to look up those test content and answer keys. And that really opened everything up for me. So by getting into the test content and answer keys, I was able to really break down each interim question into the standard that they're associated to, but then also looking at my school's curriculum maps for sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, I could work with the sixth grade team and say, look, this fits into your quarter one, you know, this fits into quarter two, this fits into quarter three for sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. You know, when we looked at the Tom system, it was really only beneficial for the eighth grade because they had gone through all of the learning already. So they were able to take the interims through Tom's, which is very, very helpful there for our eighth grade students. But we didn't want to put all of the load on the eighth grade teachers. We wanted to spread that load between sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. So when I downloaded the materials, it did say secure material, as Krista talked about, and that secure material I found out meant that it needed to be kept in class. And I was like, okay, I can do that. I got to work around not putting it out onto my Google Classroom but this at least gives me the opportunity to be able to incorporate it into each of my different classes. So in a, um, in a, by their, by the PEs, I was able to look at each test and with the passages, and we were able to get the data. We were able to look at each question in each PE and each interim question at a PLC and really cut them apart from the PDF and put them onto papers on the wall and say, look, this fits here with my team. And this is something my whole team was able to do. So this gives us the ability to be able to work with the interim questions, but also to use them in the appropriate place. So what we found was that the length of each test being 15 questions 
was a little bit harder for the full class to take. It would take at least one to two classes with the students in my district. So by breaking it down and looking at one to two questions each time, they were really able to weave it into their daily lesson plans and that way the questions could be modified. So my steps to doing this was to simply first, um, like I said, look at the test content and answer key, download those 45 questions, the earth science test of 15 questions, the life science and the physical science test of 15 questions. And we truly printed them out and cut them out with scissors to keep them inside of our classroom setting. And during a PLC time, we began to rearrange them and truly look at our curriculum guides and truly look at these questions and start to separate them out and arrange the materials by grade level. And this was the true key for us. This allowed us to be able to deliver the material in all sorts of different ways. So we could use it, my sixth grade team likes to use it as science starters and exit tickets with their lessons. Myself and my partner teacher in seventh grade, we create a quarter project based learning assignment for each quarter incorporating those interim assessments. We were able to incorporate it into eighth grade with some, with some common formative assessments within the classroom setting and then reviewing before the test, doing it whole group, doing it small group, really downloading it allowed us to do these different things. And we really need to look at, you know, the what is this graph or image showing us? Well, it showed us that, you know, things were flexible, things could be able to be modified. So the non-standardized whole class review, common formative assessments, we broke it down, we really looked at each item we looked at the items for sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. We said, okay, you know, you're learning about cells. That's a sixth grade topic for us here at our district in the integrated model. This goes to sixth grade. And they were to say, okay, you know, we taught cells in quarter one. Let's incorporate it into this lesson. And as a team, they truly planned out what lesson it was going to fit into within our PLC. And this was all within one PLC that we were able to do this. You know, an hour and a half of time really allowed us to move forward leaps and bounds as to getting these interims into our classroom setting and also sharing that responsibility within all of the teachers. So I kind of look at it as, you know, the analogy of my daughters. I've got two amazing daughters and when they were young, it was really hard for them to eat their vegetables as most kids do. It, is, it was much easier for me and my wife to take the veggies and incorporate them into a dish instead of just putting the veggies on the plate. And this is the way we saw the um, interim assessments. It was very hard for our eighth graders to just have those interim assessments there just sitting there on the test. And then when we were able to kind of cut them down and incorporate them into lessons, we saw so much more success because we were able to weave them into the dish, into the lesson, that the students were learning on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. So um, a couple of strategies and beneficial things that we use across all grades at San Ysidro Unified at Monta Vista at the school that I work with are we do a lot with breaking down the question or we do a BDTQ. So we see value in really chunking questions into smaller pieces. So we will look at each part of the question. We will look at what is the question truly asking? What type of question is this? Is there anything that the image is showing us? And by doing that, it allowed the students to really chunk up that material and not just see a question and get overwhelmed by it. We do use a graphic organizer in all of our grades and all of our classes called a RICE organizer, which works a lot with the CER, the claim evidence reasoning but it is more on the um, EL and English language learners. They really have taken grasp of this, but as they're getting, as they've been given an article, they will restate the question or the purpose of the article or the topic of the article. 
when they are investigating and citing, they are going into the article and pulling out direct evidence and telling us what paragraph it's from. And then they're explained is really that reasoning, that why or that how. So by doing this, they're able to take a much larger multi-paragraph, you know, article or multi-paragraph um, when we get into the cast piece of information. And they're really able to break it down into a usable chunk of, OK, this is what it's telling me. So this is something that we use on all of our grades. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. We also use a lot of sign starters and exit tickets. So we're able to take the interim questions and take the information and use that as a sign starter to prime our lesson for the day and teach our lesson. And then as we're getting near the end of the lesson, we may um, show the image and we may dig deep into the image in a small group setting or whole class setting. And then as they're leaving, we'll give them an exit ticket. And I'm gonna talk about that exit ticket also on the next slide. So with our RICE, like I said, it really relates a lot to the CER that we do in science, but we use RICE when we are teaching a lot of articles. So it is a restate, investigate, cite, and explain. It is just simply a graphic organizer to show the students and allow the students to show their understanding of larger texts. And with the population that we have here in Southern California and in San Jacinto, it is very important for these students to not get to that stage of frustration and to be able to learn how to break down any sort of text, including the text that they see on the cast questions. Now with our sixth grade, they did use it, um, use the questions one at a time. They were able to incorporate, like I said, into their daily lesson. They would introduce the topic using the item or the passage in their science starter. As they moved through their lesson, they were able to work with their exit tickets to be able to look at, OK, did the student actually grasp what we were trying to go through with this question? If they didn't, they were able to really pull a small group the next day and say, hey, let's go over yesterday's exit ticket with the students. So it really gives them the opportunity to be able to do these different strategies with the students in sixth grade. Now, this is kind of our exit ticket, as you would say. During the class, the students are talking about all of the information. During the class, they're going through their small group. During the class, they're going through their different stations, their whole group instruction. And then they start to fill out, OK, what is the question truly asking us? What is the action that it has? So looking at those nouns and verbs. We also look at what is the answer and why. And that is the part of the exit ticket that is truly important for the teacher at the end of class and in the next day. They can really look at that specifically for every student in their class and say, OK, did they get it? And not only did they get it, but do they understand why that's the answer to the question. And that's where we truly start making those connections. And then also, what is the graph or image showing? Because so much of this is students being able to read graphs. And that's one of the biggest struggles that we see in our middle school is just our students being able to look at a graph and see what is it telling me. So by incorporating these into sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, we can truly start to use those skills in a lower level to be able to push them further with their understanding of that. But this is something that's just turned in at the end of the day, never leaves the class. The teacher looks at, the teacher is able to pull a small group the next day and say, okay, you know, you guys all, you know, answered this. Why did you answer this? And truly get to the reasoning behind what they were trying to answer and why. So with me and my seventh grade um, partner, there's two of us at our site that teach seventh grade. We each have about 160 students. We decided to really group the, um, the PEs, the performance, uh, the performance expectations, and look at the interims as far as, OK, what ones fall into quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. And we, we created really a project-based learning assignment to end the quarter. So this is kind of a performance assessment 
type of situation. But because we were doing this at the end of each quarter, we had multiple interim questions to really pull from. So when we were doing this, we looked at this review project. We really looked at the performance tasks following the 5e design in within the NGSS science plans. And we were able to work on a gradual release of responsibility. We were able to really step back towards the end of the process and start them out kind of guided, but really by the end of the process, they have, they own the information. I mean, they're able to really show why and how these things are applicable to them and to the learning that we had just done over the prior eight weeks. So it gives us an opportunity to also wrap up the information from that unit. Now with the five with the five E design, it is the um, it is the engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate. So you kind of bounce between those, but you're able to really engage the students. We did within simulations. They explored and explained using videos and small group time, and then their elaborate was more of their performance task. Now within eighth grade, they did use it for common formative assessments. At the end of each quarter, they looked at, okay, the students have already learned the PEs in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade now. So at the end of each quarter, they're able to use those interims as a common formative assessment. We pull them back to our PLCs and we look at the data. Okay, how did the students do on this? And it really gives us an idea of how we need to move forward with it. So we did review the data. We looked at the CAST interims and reviewed the summative assessments, the interim assessments on the TOMS um, website. And we had the eighth grader students go to there because they've gone through and learned all of the standards already. It was easier for us to use it in a more standardized manner for our eighth grade students. Normally they do one day for a review and then one day for a practice TOMS um, test and then they'd kind of look over that information with the two eighth grade teachers. Now for us, what is next? Um, we really like to meet as a um, district science PLC, but also a site PLC to be able to break down the data, to be able to look at how our students are moving through these bits of information but also incorporating the new 24-25 interim assessment questions and how we're incorporating those in a different manner than the first interim assessment questions, but also looking at those new assessment questions and breaking them down by their PEs and really putting them into their sixth grade, seventh grade, or eighth grade according to our interdisciplinary model to where they learn earth, life, and physical all through sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade with those storylines. Fantastic information, Jacob. Um, and I already do see a few questions for you in the chat. Uh, using the CAST interim assessments at the middle school level is a, a hot topic. So I'm gonna give you a some time to take a look at the Q&A and mark the ones that you're interested in answering live. Then I'm gonna reiterate some of the security information and remind you about the resource guide again. Um, so Jacob did a really good job about talking about the items um, and their security. So make sh making sure they stay in the classroom, they're not posted on third party platforms, which is just what I wanna echo. There was a question in, uh, the Q&A that asked about how these can be displayed. And if you haven't taken a look at the interim assessment viewing system yet, that is a really good place to, to start and to be able to display the questions to your students. Um, but Jacob also has a few things that I'm sure he's going to get to with the Q&A, so keep them coming. Um, as he's still continuing to look for which questions he wants to answer live, I do want to remind you of the resource guide. Um, if there is a question that we are not able to get to today or that you want more clarification about, our contact information is in the resource guide. So please feel free to send any of, any of us an email after the webinar and we can chat afterward. Um, all right, Jacob, let me head over to the Q&A here and see if there's anything that you'd like to answer live. But let's go ahead and jump in with this first one. Um, what support did you receive from your administration or your district in regard to the CAST IA implementation at your school? So for us, we work very closely with um, RCOE and we have an individual that comes in from RCOE, our Riverside County Office of Ed, 
once a month and really works with our team and leads the, leads a lot of the science PLCs. So working with her, Yami, we were able to see um, really when those interims were released, but also looking at how we wanted to incorporate those interims. She really gave us a lot of flexibility of like, look, this information is out there. And that kind of spurred me on as the science lead in my side of, okay, if the information's out there, let's use the information to be able to prepare our students. So really looking at that within a PLC setting. So my, my school site did give us the time for those every week having different PLCs and seeing my science PLC. So just the support of the time from my school site and uh, um, then the experience from RCOE to really spur me on to um, really getting to know those interim questions. Awesome. So I'm hearing from both of our LA collaborators now at time. And um, like Joanna Vivian said, it took a village. It, it took a, a, your team to kind of work through this. Um, I see, Jacob, you're answering a couple typing. Would you mind um, instead answering them live? Yeah, no problem. So awesome. there, was one that, there was one that said, um, did you retype the questions to use them as a formative assessment? So with us, we did not change the interim question. We took the interim question just like it was. We simply broke it down to its different parts when we were using it inside of a classroom setting. So it, um, as we used it as the exit ticket, it was exactly like it was on the interims. We really didn't need to retype things. There would be the opportunity to do that if you had um, students with IEPs that needed to have a different um, version of that. And what's also good is in when we have our eighth graders take the interims, they can also have those different, um, not modifications, but um, different ways of helping that the cast also offers, whether it is those different supports. So we can see the same supports on the cast also in the Tom for those students. So we didn't have to retype them necessarily. We kept them as they were. And we really kind of broke them down more in the sense of, okay, let's work on this together and let's look at what this question is truly asking us. Kind of step by step. Mm -hmm. So another, one question, more? another question says, uh, what do you mean by using them one at a time? Did you do it on a testing platform or just give your students one question on a paper? So what we really looked at in the sixth grade, in the sixth grade was, um, using them one at a time, yeah, taking each question and seeing where it fit into a lesson, where it fit into their lesson sequence on their curriculum guides. And we truly took them, we didn't put them on an assessment platform or anything like that because we wanted to keep them secure. So we, we honestly weave them into the lessons and then with the exit tickets, they were just used for that teacher to really see if the learning was captured kind of on that day, just on a piece of paper and always stayed within that classroom setting. It was never really sent home, sent out of the classroom. All right, awesome. And Jacob, there's one more there for you that I'm gonna let you type the answer to. It's asking about your curriculum. And I do want to expand a little bit on this if you don't mind. So I did mention the interim assessment viewing system. That is a great place for you to be able to put a project on your board and share with your students live. So I'd highly suggest using that. Um, that's kind of a place where you, you can start there and you could do something like whiteboards. So you can also use whiteboards and show the uh, question on the IAVS or interim assessment viewing system and have your students reply, you know, respond on whiteboards as well as on paper, just kind of like how Jacob's uh, group did with the exit tickets. Show the question, have students respond on paper and collect them. So that's just something I wanted to expand on. Thank you so much for engaging with us in the Q&A. It does look, Jacob, that I ha we've answered all of the questions. We're gonna go ahead and move on now to our final presenter. But if you have any questions for Jacob, Joanna or Vivian, or for the CDE, please feel free to add them into the Q&A. We have our last Q&A segment coming up. So again, add your questions as they come up so we can get to as many as we can. Um, so we've heard some great shared practices from our elementary school and our middle school LEA collaborators at this point. And now it's time to have our friends at Liberty Union High School District weigh in. Um, you'll, you'll have the opportunity to hear about the practices in place that make it possible for this high school district to administer the CAST interim assessments to every student in their district and the reason behind their decision to do this. 
So sharing with us next is Todd Arola, uh, Director of Curriculum and Instruction for Liberty Union High School District. Uh, three instructional coaches, which are pictured with him here, are also credited for their collaboration and support in preparing some of the topics being shared with you today. So we're really lucky to get to work with them as well. Um, we're lucky to get to hear from Todd today um, as he shares his experiences with the CAST IAs from both the district perspective in terms of their implementation plan and the ways that the coaches are helping their teachers be successful with the CAST IA administration and the value of data in SIRS. Uh, before I turn it over to Todd, again, the Q&A feature, I'm going to remind you again. Um, but it is now my pleasure to welcome Todd to share about the extensive interim assessment implementation plan um, that his schools follow um, and kind of how they adopted and support their teachers in accomplishing this. Take it away, Todd. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, uh, wonderful things happening that Joanna, Victoria shared with Delano and then um, Jacob with uh, San Jacinto. Um, there are differences between all of our districts and geographic areas, but the one similarity is that uh, that value placed on the IAs within science. And that's what we're here to talk about this afternoon. Some of the, the things I'm going to, to talk about are really about that when. So, so when are teachers supported to do this work? What does that look like? How does that look? Um, I'm at a district office, so I'm not at a school site. But I definitely wanted to uh, to reiterate what Krista had shared with our three instructional coaches who are previous science teachers. We'll 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 circle back to this in a little while. But they are instructional coaches. They have uh, made huge huge efforts for us as a school district, specifically with the IAs in science, to be able to launch these. And for me, being in a district office. Uh, I, I support a myriad of things, um, some of which involve um, uh, assessment, um, instructional material adoption, CTE, English language learner program, um, and then federal and state compliance. And this slide really shows our, our demographics. We have three comprehensive high schools, a continuation site and an alternative education site. Uh, we serve about 8,250. 50 students, 7% of our students are made up of English language learners, 15% are special education, and about 25% are socioeconomically disadvantaged. We're in the Brentwood area of Northern California, um, and we're about 45 miles east of San Francisco. Our area saw exponential growth around the year 2000, and um, the nature of our, of our area and education changed quite a bit and very, very quickly. Uh, diversity um, is an understatement. Um, the area like Jacob had shared about being a rural agricultural basic, uh, that was Brentwood pre 2000. It's changed quite a bit and again, very quickly. We are the largest per square mile district in Contra Costa County. Um, we serve students of, from about 200 square miles. Our instructional coaches um, make up each of our comprehensive sites. We have, uh, we're fortunate to be able to have nine total instructional coaches and they are uh, 0.5 instructional coaches. We're on an AB schedule. So a lot of the things I share will be contextually based. So if you're wondering how we're making what I share work, some of that involves the back end support that's given to people, whether it's time or uh, knowledge, or just various, various areas of support. We have uh, three instructional coaches. You saw their names on the other slide. They are, the, the important thing about them being 0.5 is they're practitioners in the classroom. They still are in the classroom trying the things, they're practicing what they're preaching, trying different things um, like IAs to their students, and then seeing what that looks like, the yields that it harvests, and just a myriad of other things um, related to being an instructional coach. Uh, our common assessments really percolated from our transition to Common Core. If you roll back the clock, um, we saw a need for teacher analysis and data, and our teachers were uh, really, really interested in reviewing and collaborating across the district. So no one felt like they were in a silo. 
Um, ELA and math have been using IABs. It's important to note that the interim assessment blocks are math and English. Um, science does not have blocks, so we just consider them IAs. But our teachers really wanted um, something for uh, for our students to to be exposed to. And when the IABs came out for math and English, we swiftly adopted those. When the um, when the IAs came up, we looked at that, and um, we also we also uh, deployed those. Uh, why why IAs? So they do quite a few things for our for our teachers and our students. Um, they help monitor the progress. They really help teachers check students' understanding about specific science concepts if we're focusing on science, which we are this afternoon. Um, it allows our teachers to identify specific areas where students may need additional support or additional enrichment. Uh, they're checkpoints throughout the year. They prepare students for summative assessments. Uh, they're aligned. It's really important, and I know the previous presenters acknowledge this. They're aligned with uh, summative assessments, whether it's uh, year-end uh, state tests, but they really help students get familiar with the format and types of questions. And we heard that uh, from Jacob previously about the rigor and the depth of knowledge or DOK that's embedded within these assessments. They also help engage students and they can be used uh, in a myriad of ways, but uh, they, they, we've used them to involve students in self-assessment. Um, students get a, an opportunity to have some peer feedback and it just enhances their understanding and engagement um, with science material. Lastly, they're a tool to support continuous learning and environment, making the ed process more responsive and effective for our teachers. And then what the most important thing that, um, that the yields within our PLCs, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while, just really being a facilitator and, um, and, and encouraging teacher reflection. So previously mentioned, um, our instructional coaches uh, rode the coattails uh, from ELA and math. We've been using the IABs for a while with quarterly common assessments, district-wide common assessments. Um, we also have social science common assessments, although those are teacher created. Um, there are no IAs or IABs in social science yet, but for math and English, they, they've they been um, administering the IABs and reflecting on the results for years and years. So when, um, when science, when the state came out with the science IAs, similar to what Joanna from Delano spoke about previously, we also chose to do them really close. I think they chose February. We chose to do them um, toward the end of February, early March as a, as a pilot and allow our teachers to administer them, students uh, reflect on the results, look at the, uh, the data and have some conversations about um, how these could possibly replace what, um, what, was, what were existing common assessments that were teacher made. Uh, how does this work within our district? Um, our comprehensive school sites have what we call PDD, Professional Development Days. They're late start Wednesdays without students. And so we're a high school only district, just to reiterate that. Um, it allows a lot of opportunities for us to focus on, uh, um, on content specific professional development and a myriad of other decisions. Um, these PDD or late start Wednesdays are about an hour, which gives teachers uh, 50 minutes to an hour to have some of these uh, professional development opportunity times to do things like scoring. Um, and also, and even more importantly, the analysis of that data. So after teachers have hand scored those, um, we aggregate these as a district for teachers to be able to see their own results their department's results, and then the results, again, as an aggregate across the district, um, and really, really dig in to that analysis piece, giving teachers about an hour of time to 
uh, to meet in their professional learning communities to talk about how they can improve their best practices. One of our instructional coaches created a brief video to share how teachers are supported with these IAs. And one of the important things uh, with a fresh set of eyes being science teachers, they could they could see the the um, the challenges that ELA and math had previously. And we really wanted to remove any barriers. Oftentimes there are technology barriers with just access, um, whether it be administering them to students or or uh, or accessing the data. So we really wanted to remove any of those. And we created a video where teachers uh, can take all the way from how to administer them to accessing the data for analysis by instructor. Hello, I'm Corey Spainhauer with the Liberty Union High School District, and I'm one of our science coaches. One of the things I think we did at our district that made um, administering these interim assessments so successful was that we removed the technology barriers. So many of our teachers are wonderful science teachers, but it seems like there's always something new with technology. And so making it really user friendly to use the CASP website, administer the test, grade the test, and then look at your results is a really essential piece of this puzzle rather than just sending out an email and saying, we expect this to get done. We really wanted to make sure our teachers felt supported. Um, so we would walk through going into the Tom system and then using the links on this page to get to all the places you needed to be. Whether you are administering a test or you are doing the teacher hand scoring system or you are going into SIRS to look at the results. And we made um, PDFs with screenshots of all of these things so that our teachers would easily be able to access this. Um, we have one PDF with just giving the instructions how to set up your testing session, how to administer, even walking through the logging in and not being afraid when you have to reset your password, um, going to the links, starting a session. session, everything down to which test to select. We were very grateful that this year we saw there was a second set of interim assessments. Last year we did the earth and space science for all of our students the first quarter. So this year we are doing the earth and space sciences too for all of our students this quarter. Um, we showed all the different choices you have for administering test sessions and showed teachers even how to get students logged in and then put in their operational test session ID. Next, we showed teachers how to hand score. This seemed to be a really important piece to our puzzle um, because it looks different from Mastery Connect or Illuminate or Canvas, any of the other things we've used. Another piece that was really important for our teachers is that it takes usually an overnight load for those scores then to show up so that if you're trying to use them for analysis or if you want to enter them in your grade book, you know to expect not to have them right away. And um, the last thing we looked at was the SIRS, the California Educator Reporting System, and what that looks like inside. And what this looks like is going to be different um, depending on how your district has set it up. But for us, we have our separate periods, and then we can go in and see our students. And we would find it under the life sciences, the physical sciences, or the earth and space sciences, depending on what we recommend. Okay, thank you, Corey. So uh, one of the other pieces here in terms of context uh, for teachers to be able to do everything that our uh, wonderful instructional coach just shared was just our calendar year. Um, in our resources, I, I believe we put the calendar and you'll be able to see our academic year, but just a couple of things that are really important uh, for us. We start school in July. So I think it was July 29th was our first day with teachers and students. Um, but we're on a modified traditional where we have two weeks off in October. And if you look there, our teachers and students, they're off right now. They're also off the last two weeks of March. The reason why this is important when we talk about IAs or even IABs is it creates a, a, a really highly structured beginning and end. And so we have district quarterly assessments. At the end of September, students have taken the common assessment, the IA, and then 
teachers are given time and if they choose to do it over the break, that's their, their, their choice, but they're given time to do any hand scoring items and to input those to where they can then during one of those yellow times, I mentioned these earlier, the PDDs, the late start Wednesdays, they can meet to do their data analysis. And so for us, um, for example, most, uh, I think I think two content areas are doing it on the 16th of October and two are doing it on the 23rd. Um, the, so the, the, the teachers are given time to collaborate from about 8.30 to 9.20 to really dig into that data analysis piece beyond their own results. And the students begin that day at 9.30. Um, our science teachers continue to explore best practices of using the IAs. As new as these are, uh, we are really proud of the way they've just they've taken these and run with them. Not only supporting teachers with with different pieces of access and analysis, but um, just being ambassadors really for students getting better at being better. Um, they've already found yields within the IA questions. And I know Vivian, Joanna, um, Jacob as well talked about cross-cutting principles, cause and effect. Our science teachers have seen um, in a granular fashion some really, really, really good things come out of students um, being exposed to these IAs, even though they're very, very new. Um, they've also enriched collaboration between teachers and, um, and they've They've been um, kind of this complete missing piece within our PLCs of science with the data analysis. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Todd. I do already see a few questions for you in the Q&A, and we're going to finish up today's session with the Q&A. And if I have some time to share some CDE resources, I will. Um, but our presenters did a fantastic job, and, and Todd, appreciate how in-depth you got with uh, your schedule. Um, so I do want to remind you, if we don't get to any of your questions or there's a question that we missed, please find our information in the resource guide and feel free to send us uh, an email and we can chat afterward. There is a, some love for you in the Q&A already, Todd, for someone from your district or who knows your district who is appreciating you being here. Um, so I see that. Uh, and then there are a few specific questions like, can you send the link to that video? Uh, so depending on there, there's if there is secure information for Todd's district, we couldn't put it in the um, resource guide. Um, but if you want to reach out to Todd and see if there's something that he can um, get to you that does not have any school any, uh, secure school information, I'm sure, you know, Todd, you'd be willing to uh, see what you can do. Uh, but Todd, go ahead and answer, uh, uh, select some ones that you want to answer live. Sure. Yeah, I see one and I and I clicked um, answer live. Uh, why did you, the question, why did you choose earth and space science to test all students as opposed to, I think it was only live for physical science. Um, and the our, our instructional coaches uh, really felt that with the, with the rollout this year, and these being new, it was it was okay for us to whether students um, in, enrolled in any of the of the life or physical sciences that we would use Earth and space for the first quarter. They do not think that's they they don't think they are certain that in the future that won't be the case. But for the first quarter, they felt that teachers would have something a value to analyze together. And it would be a stepping stone of all those barriers that the instructional coach in the video shared and that we've shared from the district office to get past those to then branch out perhaps into some other um, assessments. And I'm and I don't want to speak for the for the state, but much like ELA and math IABs, over time there becomes a deeper and deeper repository for teachers to to select different um, assessments, I imagine that that will be the same for science as well. All right, it looks like I see another one for you asking to share some of your materials. So I'm gonna, if you don't mind uh, speaking to that for just a second, as we look for some other questions that come up for you here.
So Todd, can you share the PDFs and video you made? Um, do you want to respond to that really quickly for a few people who are asking? Because I know people got really excited when they saw that video. Yeah, we'll take a look like Chris has shared. If there's anything that is um, that is uh, sensitive and, and, and should not be shared, uh, we'll take a look. Maybe what we can do, Chris, is, is talk after. And yeah. I could even go back and blur some different things because there is still value in the structure which doesn't change, but if there's any student data or or data that that folks shouldn't see, uh, it would be it would it would be too bad if that were the reason they weren't able to view. So we can absolutely do that. And if nothing else, the one thing I would share is just make it make it a, a foundation for you to build your own with your own um, educational leader voices. But absolutely, we could take a look at that. And then the PDF resources. If they're not already in there, um, I'll take a look and see what was shared and we can we can put those into the, the folder as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, thank you all of our presenters for doing such a fantastic job with our Q&A piece. If there are any other questions you want to answer in the Q&A, go ahead and type your answer now. And again, if we don't get to them since we have three minutes and I really want to be respectful of time, um, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is in the resource guide. Uh, so I do want to move into just a few um, resources that I want to talk about. Um, we don't have a ton of time, but they're all listed in your resource guide. So I'm going to give a very quick overview, and then I'll have Amy launch us. Uh, a few that I do want to call out are the CAST Interim Assessment Fact Sheet and just the CAST Manal Pack website. Um, there's a CAST section of that website that I highly suggest you dive into, along with the um, the CAST interim assessment fl organization flyer would be a really good place for teachers to start because I don't have a ton of time. I'm not gonna be able to show them or get too deep into them, uh, but feel free to go take a look in your resource guide and all the links are there for you. Uh, there are also some trainings that are going to, that are free of charge on the CDE website um, that I would definitely suggest you jump into if you have some time. So we have the uh, search trainings. There's three different trainings uh, available for you. There's some micro learning videos there for SIRS, as well as, as well as interim informative assessment training series that has three modules that I would definitely suggest taking a look at as well. Um, but all are linked in your resource guide, like I said. Uh, and with that, I do want to thank you so much for joining us and engaging with us today. The questions were fantastic, and we're just so glad that we have this opportunity to have our educators share today about all the things they're doing um, to make CAST IAs successful at their schools and districts and school sites. So, Amy, with one minute to go, I'm going to return it back to you to bring it to a close. Thank you, Krista, and thank you everyone for your wonderful presentations. I've actually turned on the chat today um, now so that we can um, do an exit ticket. Please share in the chat box one key takeaway that you'll be using in your own teaching or sharing with your colleagues. So go ahead and put that in the chat. And we would love to see a waterfall of ideas of things that you're going to be taking away with you. So while I finish up uh, my things, go ahead and uh, type in the chat for us. All right, uh, we encourage you to subscribe to the Assessment Spotlight. This communication goes out every Friday and includes the latest updates from our assessment division. You can also follow us on X. Our handle is at CDE Assessments. And you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook as well. All right. Thank you so much for attending today. As we like to say, you are uh, we are your collaborators in this work, and we are so happy that you come and join us for these trainings. <clears throat> and we would like to say goodbye and have a wonderful week. We'll see you at the next one. See you later.